then it's time for um, our question session. So Richard, if you please will come back, and Camilla as well. I think we can have a trialogue. So do you want to sit or stand? We can sit here. Please. Please uh, have the one in the middle. Yeah. No, you can be in the middle now. Yeah. Yeah. So starting with you, Richard. Um, I was uh, astonished because I've been working in the financial industry for quite some time and um, actually starting in the mid 70s and uh, I used to work with foreign exchange and uh, this was the time of monetary policy and monetarism and Milton Friedman and everything and uh, I studied on the money supply one, two and three which was um, uh, announced monthly regularly but then I was astonished to read then in between, so for the coming 30 years, I've been astonished that chief economists often say that uh, this will have this or that implication on real economy, uh, meaning that uh, what I'm doing is not for real, it's some, some fake money. <laughs> so I was very curious about the source of that expression, real economy, but when I read your uh, a little extract from your article or your work, uh, I found uh, the answer, and that's very interesting, of course. So I start with one question to you. Uh, you mentioned that central banks are standing for only 3% of money creation, and 97% was ordinary banks. Uh, on another slide, you mentioned that cash is 3%. Is, is that the same number? Is it, uh, is it so that central banks only create cash? Um, I'm glad you picked up on this uh, technical point. Um, yes and no. Central banks create actually two types of money. But one type doesn't affect us because it never circulates. So cash is the central bank money that affects us because we can have it, we can make transactions with it. Um, that is 3%. They create another 3% which never circulates and that is the so-called reserves um, of the banks at the central bank. They are they're a form of central bank money which only exists on the balance sheet of the central bank and the textbooks and, and economists always talk about for example now when, when these reserves have swelled a lot at the ECB, at the Bank of England, at the Riksbank and, and the Bank of Japan, huge amounts of reserves and so a lot of commentators are saying, well, why aren't the banks lending this money? Well, hang on, they cannot. This, this is, just, this is um, just account entries on the central bank balance sheet that can never be transferred away from the central bank. How do they come into existence? Well, the central bank purchases something from the banks or it just gives a straight loan to the banks. And just like the banks when they create money on the balance sheet, the central bank now creates money on the balance sheet. So one bank can reduce its reserves, but only if another bank increases its reserves and vice versa. So it's a, it's a closed loop, it's reserve money. Um, so what is the money that affects us? Well, there is the central bank money uh, in, in the form of paper, notes and coins. And then the rest of the money, 97% is <coughs> bank credit um, and this is legally speaking private company credit that um, private entities have created and hopefully that was for example uh, savings banks uh, for good things the majority is likely to be private bank money created by the big banks um, and a certain a large proportion will be for speculative transactions. So um, I will not be standing in, in that corner for too long, but one qu question more. Uh, was it easier to define money when money was a physical thing? Uh, is this something about electronic money? And could you just comment a little bit on Bitcoin and other um, uh, electronic uh, devices and, yeah. and 
the money supply, as you know it, is that more close to Bitcoin than a real coin? I think it is, and I think it's it's a good uh, it's a good way to introduce uh, electronic money in the discussion. But for your first question uh, was it easier when when it was gold? Yes, in fact, that's why the economists and um, the experts and the textbooks talk about money as if we were still be using gold and silver coins. That's the way money is treated in textbooks. That's why there's no banks there, because it, that was already the, um, you know, from the 17th century when banking took off, starting um, actually in, in Sweden and, and the UK in particular, and Holland. Um, so we're all well represented um, here today. Um, it, it, analytically, that was already a problem. Um, how do you handle banks in this? Um, and the textbooks, the economic theory simply left them out entirely, which suited the bankers because then they can't be analyzed what they're really doing. Um, and so, yes, it was so easy that many people still today want to pretend that we live in the world of the gold standard. Actually, on this, you know, we, we talk about money flows, and even I, I must have used an expression like that, money is extracted from the region to the center and so on. And so we, we have this image that money flows. But of course, the reality is money doesn't flow. There are no money flows. All it is is a system of credits and debits, a bookkeeping system nowadays. Um, this is a particular, um, particularly important point for developing countries because they've been told for decades by the international bankers, oh, you want to develop? Uh, you need savings. You know, you need this thing, money, like like gold, you know, we need to ship it to you and we can lend it to you at interest. Um, and they, they, they were persuaded to borrow foreign money in foreign denomination <laughs> at interest. Their currencies tended to depreciate, so their debts were rising, when actually this money never entered their economies. It never entered their economies. Why? Well, it's foreign money. That's why. They borrowed dollars, they borrowed DMARCs, they borrowed yen, they borrowed euros. Well, they stay in the eurozone, in the dollar zone, in the yen zone. Do these developing countries have their own banking system and central bank? Yes. Do they need to borrow this money for their own domestic economies? No. They can use it to purchase things from abroad. Right. Um, but that's not usually the best way to develop, you know, to get... The, um, too dependent on that. Anyway, that's another story. You should sell abroad instead of buy from abroad. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, okay, th thank you uh, for explaining, clarifying that. Uh, Camilla, uh, when I was listening to you, I had one um, practical question. Uh, you said that uh, the f f a microphone host should be started now soon. Uh, there are a little bit less than two months to be able to do it in 2014. Uh, what are the most important steps remaining before you get started? Yes, uh, before started it's uh, uh, to get some ma members who want to do this and uh, I, I, I was thinking about organizations who is working in, in the region, over the region, like Companion. And, and, are, and, all, and are all people in this room, are they already members or do you think they will be members? I hope they will be members. Also about these associations, they are representative, yes. Okay. Yes, so members, and is that the only thing or is there anything else? No, then you need also to see how should you finance the, the rule of it, the administration of it and so, because you need to go out and talk with uh, people and so, and let it, the marketing. Is What's the regulatory situation? Do you need any special uh, license or so? No, because the microphone Sweden have all the licenses, so you, you can connect it with the microphone Sweden. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, then on a different note, uh, I couldn't help um, comparing because um, you were telling a lot of situations where social money was needed. Um, there is a not so far away example of social money which was called subprime lending in US uh, and that didn't work out so well. So how do you meet that challenge? Because uh, 
the fact that you need money is not necessarily the only uh, rationale for lending it. Uh, no. So how do, how do you do that balancing? Uh, you, uh, you see, when, when we have started this uh, funding, you have this, uh, of course, you have need to talk with the people who want to have the loan or the credits or, uh, or what it is. And then you have to, to do some, uh, uh, what you call it, titta på om det här håller businessmässigt. Of course, you need to have some business ID, otherwise it's not possible. And uh, if it, uh, I, can, I can only go, go to the experience of uh, uh, Microphone Vest. They have had two uh, cases who didn't work out, but that didn't need that because they have some. They are doing so small things, you know. So it it doesn't matter because uh, the, the, they are they are. They they have any importance over their ground capital, man says, so they lose their endo, like so. I think it was so. It's so small volume. It's not so much risk. Not so much risk. Okay. <laughs> Mm. <coughs> um, let me see. Uh, Richard, you were talking a lot about um, well, the Japanese example uh, that banks ought to be centrally steered, but uh, still you were saying that central banks were no good, uh, especially Bank of Japan, if I understood it correctly. Uh, <coughs> but then you switched over to local banking and uh, that's a different situation and we are aware of that. Uh, I am aware of that uh, working with savings banks. One interesting thing with savings banks is that, um, and I don't know if you have found that internationally, uh, in Sweden I haven't yet got scientific evidence of this but uh, we will try to get it. Um, but people tell me that the, the credit risk, is at least if you um, if you measure it by uh, ordinary methods or national statistic methods, credit risks tend to be higher in savings banks than in the co overall banking community. But the interesting thing is that credit losses are much lower. And if that is true, if it is so that credit risk is higher but credit losses are lower, that tells you something about the good of local banking. And I know from my own experience, um, before joining Sparbank and Asriksverbund, I used to work at the savings bank for five years. And I know that uh, savings banks almost never put the business in bankruptcy, simply because the savings banks know that uh, when I do that, the 20 employees of this company are uh, mortgage customers of my bank and then they will be in problem. So you have an incentive to work creatively and find solutions, which you don't have if you're at a far distance. Um, this part of the credit side, have you met that somewhere else? Um, I think it's also reflected um, this point about you know, the banker being creative and wanting to come up with solutions um, by the um, the regional principle, so that the savings bank, um, when there's a network of savings bank, each has their, their own geographically restricted area, so there is a limited space, and that creates also the right incentives. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at the UK, for example, and there's some deprived areas, and you want to set up um, a banking structure, um, the big banks would say, well, that's not an attractive area. We're not going there. And they pick and choose what suits them. But if you set up a network of geographically restricted local banks, there will be one for this deprived area. Now, what does the banker do? Well, they're in the same boat as the local community. So they have to think what exactly, as you say, what helps the local community, what can be done. Maybe getting involved with startups um, attracting um, uh, maybe some people to the area um, with ideas and so on. And this is, this is the right incentive structure, so I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course the other principle um, you're touching on is the principle of knowledge and trust, mutual trust. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're in a, in a small town and there is a s local bank, um, the banker knows knows you, knows your parents, knows where you live, where your family lives, 
you know the banker and their children and so on. So it's, it, and it goes both ways um, because nobody wants to let down the other and that creates, even though the risk may be higher, a stronger incentive for everyone to, to uh, uh, give their best to lead to a positive outcome for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that incentive is not there when you move to large scale so-called transaction banking, anonymous, just look at the figures, don't care about people because it's big numbers, top down in a big organization. Um, you lose that, that trust and therefore also these incentives. We, that's a different way of saying that, but we used to say that um, being local also means that you're long-sighted, you have a longer perspective, because if you are banking in a local area, like a savings bank, uh, the, and you will have a market to be banked against in 35 years, you must think about that, so every decision you take must hold for 35 years, hence be sustainable. Uh, so the, the time perspective is for us very important. And I think that's also, you Camilla were mentioning that it's not important of making profits, but what you can do with the profit. I also think that the time perspective is interesting in that phenomenon because Swedish savings banks are making profit, but not necessarily for each quarter. It's not, it's not so urgent, uh, it's a time frame matter. Um, and when you add the time perspective into profit, that does not necessarily be bad. Uh, it can be also good profits. Um, by the way, Richard, I have, um, you were asking one of your first slides about boom and bust, what is the cause? Uh, I have the answer to that. <laughs> but that's only for the, the speculative part of it. So the thing that went into financial economy, uh, ages back I used to work in investment banking and uh, our chief analyst at the firm I was at had a screensaver and that was telling me all about stock markets because the screensaver said fear is temporary, greed is permanent. <laughs> that is what is steering the markets. <laughs> it's probably a good saying, yeah. Human nature, but be because of the way human nature works, um, I think small-scale local banking is more suited because it brings things back to human scale and then whenever you have these larger organizations it's true of course in other industries but in banking is particularly dangerous um, and you, you lose this human um, check and balances and the human scale that's when you're in trouble I couldn't agree more. Um, unfortunately, um, the regulators and the Basel Committee, the Financial Stability Board, uh, they don't know this yet. <laughs> How shall we make them know? Yes, um, and that's a very, and I'm glad you raised that, that's a very important point. Um, I mentioned that German savings banks are suffering a lot from that in cooperative banks because Brussels uh, is stepping up pressure all the time and the ECB, new bank regulations, Basel rules become European law uh, without any democratic discussion mm -hmm. immediately. So what's going on there? Well, what's going on is the big banks in Europe, um, they, they can afford um, hundreds, and in fact it seems to be thousands, of highly paid lobbyists who lobby, um, particularly in, in Brussels, um, those who draft the European regulations and directives. Um, and it seems that the City of London Corporation is very influential in Brussels. And that is politically something we need to recognize and we need to develop strategies against because what is the City of London Corporation? It is not part of the United Kingdom and it's not part of the EU and yet it has a massive influence. Well that's very strange. Shouldn't it be subject to democratic principles within the UK? Yes. Well the Queen is not allowed to enter without permission. Um, it's not part of the UK. It has uh, a member of um, Parliament who's not elected um, in Parliament to watch out for the interests of the City of London. Um, there's only 8,000 people living in the City of London. It's a very small part of London, a square mile. Um, 
and um, they don't have the majority of the vote because the majority of the vote is in the hands of companies and it goes by the number of staff and which are the biggest employers the banks so it is a state for and by the banks and that seems to be very influential not just in the UK but in the EU and that's very strange and we need to develop um, strategies to safeguard democracy there. Okay, uh, I have one more question for each of you but uh, now turn to the audience. Um, what questions are we having from the audience? Um, shall that, uh, well you have to speak up. Please. My name is Per Amigen. I noticed that both of you mentioned that we need a sustainable growth. But this is something that is non existent. <laughs> you cannot have a sustainable growth. We must have an economy that is sustainable, but it must not grow. It, but but uh, uh, we have to have a different uh, distribution of the economy. That's what we work with, also in the Yeah, if, if I may respond, um, I entirely agree. Um, the, the reason why I use growth in many of my presentations is as a, as a shortcut to refer to something we're familiar with. But if you actually examine GDP, and I didn't mention that GDP has a lot of problems, um, it's, a, it's an artificial measure. And any physicist should be able to explain to us that, just as you say, there is actually no growth. So, so what is this GDP that gives us this illusion of growth? Um, it is just um, an arbitrary, well not quite arbitrary, but it's, it's, a, it's a composition of certain indicators that give us the illusion that growth is taking place by counting activities but not counting many of the negatives that come with these activities, such as depletion of natural resources, which are the source of this growth. If we counted all the negatives as well, we'd see what physics, what we know from physics and energy, you know, uh, the laws of thermodynamics, there is no growth. So it's a concept that was created um, in order to make the banking system work because bankers want interest and if we didn't have uh, this concept of GDP there would be a problem a in figuring out how much to lend to a sovereign that's historically in my view how it developed uh, because GD nominal GDP gives you the ability to service loans um, and secondly um, if we didn't have the illusion of growth people wouldn't agree to pay interest because it becomes obvious that it's a, an accelerating transfer mechanism from the many to the few. If we have the illusion of growth, it's sort of, yeah, there's, there's a bit of interest here from the many to the few, but we have so much growth, we're all getting better off. And therefore we don't see what's happening. So, so I, I agree with that, um, but, and, and so we need reforms. Um, but we also have to work, I think, strategically. Um, and at the moment, I think that the best, the fastest we can get progress is to set up more community-owned banks to work within the system. But the next step then should be, and there's more discussions later on, the introduction of community currencies and then moving away from interest, which you have you've pioneered in banking. And I think we need to move in that direction. Um, to start from the beginning with that is very probably very hard, so it's very admirable what you've achieved. Um, but it is the way we need to go. And then, of course, we need to reform these concepts such as GDP. Thank you. We had one more question over here. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I completely agree with the, the, what you said about the German the local banking systems, but isn't there also some inspiring examples in the United States? I'm thinking about the different kinds of community banks, the credit unions, for instance. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, it's true, and, and the credit union movement, I mean, so historically, it, it, um, it moved to the US and from there then moved to Ireland and the UK. 
Um, and so the US is, is a good example. There's many credit unions and, and local banks. Uh, the big percentage of banking, probably more than 20%, so a significant share. Um, of course, they're also mixed in with for-profit local banks. So there's, many, there's, there's a lot of diversity in the US uh, banking sector. The number of banks is around 15,000, so it's a very large banking sector. It's a good one to analyze and get data um, to test for various hypotheses, uh, such as I've just finished uh, with a colleague a study on, on this, this claim I made that large banks lend to large companies doing large deals who lends to small firms, it is small banks, and using f over 10,000 US banks, including the uh, community banks, um, we could confirm that the data set. So the US is another example of a diverse banking sector, and it shows that it's good to have local banks. But of course, we also have the problem that we have in many countries that there is this um, politically very well connected small number of very, very large banks that still seem to dominate policy making. Thank you. And one question here. Uh, Henry Law, a couple, a few questions which are related, they're linked together about interest. Um, the very first paper in cyclical in 1745 condemned it. Uh, it's condemned in the Bible. We've got Islamic banking which doesn't have interest. Um, in my lifetime, as a depositor, interest amounts to next to nothing if you take into account inflation anyway. Um, there's another theory about interest that I've come across, that interest paid on mortgages isn't interest at all, it's rent. And there was a, um, I think it was in the 17th century, an English economist um, worked out that interest and rent more or less settle at the same value. Could you? Comment on those things, please. It's an interesting thought. So who owns the place then, if we're just paying rent for the mortgage? But of course, in Islamic banking, that's how it's done, that um, the, uh, the bank purchases the property, and then instead of paying interest, you're sort of buying it back bit by bit. Um, and so I suppose one can, I mean, that it's very similar to actually just standard banking. Um, so you could also turn it around and say, well, actually, that they, st they still have interest. It's just legally, technically, you know, it's not called interest. And, and so uh, critics of Islamic banking would point this out. And I, I would tend to agree Christian banking um, is older and avoided interest as well. Technically, this is how the bond market started, right? You issue at discount. Um, you're getting 90 but you repay 100, there's no interest. Well, of course there is. Um, so that's the same thing. So these are ways of avoiding the interest uh, by the letter of the law, but by the spirit there is still interest. Um, and therefore we should think about ways where there truly is no interest. And I think that, that is the way forward. Um, and it is, it is interesting that in, in virtually all major religions, interest is forbidden. It's considered something very wrong. But also the Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristoteles, they were very clear. Interest is wrong. Um, it's against, in fact, it was using an argument from physics, as we just said, it's against the laws of thermodynamics. It's against nature. Why? Well, what is it? It's just... You know, interest is not a big mystery. It's just a, a simple compounding exponential formula. So it's a rule for um, transferring money. Interest is a transfer payment. And it's a rule that um, says that there should be an increasing amount over time that's being transferred. Um, and that's all it is. So it's man-made clearly for the benefit of the lender. Um, and we can clearly come up with better rules on how to manage this. And I think it should be possible, ultimately, to create banking without interest. Who invented the interest? Sorry? Who invented interest? 
Um, it's a good question. I mean, it's been around. Uh, people say that it started in, you know, with the first banks, which was in Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago. Um, there was banking. There was a cashless economy. Um, and, uh, you know, cashless transfer. Um, so likely it started then. And so it's interesting that the inventors of interest, the Babylonians, already realized that it has redistributional effects, a negative effect, inequality will result. And they had a solution. And the solution was that whenever a new king started, all the old debts were cancelled. Now, mostly the debts were to the king, so I suppose that was easier to do, but not entirely all to the king. So there was a, a cancellation of debts every, I mean, it was a bit random, obviously, but 20, 30 years, there would be cancellation of debts to work against it. Now, we've adopted this idea of interest, but not the solution already recommended by the Babylonians, which is a bit strange, isn't it? Well. Um, we have banking crises, but they actually tend to accelerate the transfer from the many to the few. Thank you. We have the last question here from Jonas. I was just wondering <coughs> if we have investors here in Motala or the region of East Sweden, uh, and, we, and they would like to start a cooperative bank, how would they go about doing it? Um, this is a question we need to ask actually, well, we need to ask you, um, because in some countries in, in the EU, the banking regulator will give a banking authorization to a cooperative entity, such as in Germany. Most of the cooperatives are banks, and the largest number of banks are cooperatives. That's the situation in Germany. Um, but in the UK, um, the Banking authorities have never given a banking license to a cooperative, and there's a fairly negative attitude um, by banking supervisors um, and influential sort of legal opinion against cooperatives. So um, I don't know the situation in Sweden whether I mean there are cooperative banks yes, presumably, but it's not easy to to start. It's uh, it's very tough to start. So yes. We'd have to look into that. Finance inspection and so on, you know. <laughs> but that, that you know, that you should know. Uh, I know. Um, well, the thing is, this is not a very constructive answer, but uh, I, I have two big hurdles for creating new savings banks, which would be almost the same thing. Um, and uh, it's not, of course, uh, any fun to just identify hurdles, but to be able to think outside the box, you have to identify the box, kind of. Uh, one hurdle is um, regulation. Uh, the regulators have built huge um, hurdles for starting. Uh, when today's savings banks were started, mainly in the 19th century, uh, then the founders, there were four founders, and they themselves were sitting behind the cashier's desk each Saturday, so one Saturday each. So it could go 10 years before you have any salary expenses. Today you need to hire a compliance officer, a credit controller, a risk controller. You have to have a staff of 15, 20 people before you have the first income krona. So that's a huge uh, hurdle for new entry. This was not the purpose, but it's a side effect. Um, that could possibly be handled. The other is actually more tricky. When the founders of savings banks once again, back in the 19th century, uh, was the pharmacist, uh, the wholesaler, uh, the big farmer, and so on. And they were su supposed to be the good men of the countryside, and they decided to create a savings bank. Now, the, the rationale or the incentive for the pharmacist, the wholesaler, and so on, was of course that if, if uh, creating a savings bank meant that this should give opportunity for less fortunate people to uh, save for their future, they knew that they should be able to spend some more money at the pharmacy and at the... So the, the whole economy was local. Today, if you start a local savings bank or cooperative bank, and then the money runs off to the nearest uh, shopping mall or to the internet and buying stuff directly from China. So big part of the economy is international or global. 
that is uh, a challenge. Uh, but I hope that there are possibilities to come over that. The last uh, savings bank was created in 1944. That was Kiruna Spar Bank. Since then it hasn't happened in Sweden, but it might happen. Mm -hmm. uh, dear panel and dear audience, we are out of time. Um, so could you round off this, Richard, by, by uh, even if I now identified two hurdles, could you describe two or three steps that are important and um, in your effort in uh, Hampshire, for instance? Concerning the first hurdle, um, I would, um, based on my experience of you know, watching central banks and analyzing central banks for the last um, well, more than 20 years, um, not be quite as generous as you by suggesting that's entirely accidental that their rules uh, make it very hard for small banks. I think, it's, I think we can probably all agree that they certainly have a focus to think of the big banks first, no matter how much you want to go into intentions uh, concerning the rest. And um, therefore, clearly, their rules are not designed to help small banks. Uh, it's, of course, for, for central bankers and, and bank regulators, it's the same. They, they like to deal with big players. They're a big player, and big players like to play uh, rather with other big players. And that means they're not intrinsically interested in small banks. But we have to um, use basically activism and political, get politically organized and make this a public issue that there is a problem, that bank regulators are really slowing or even preventing the creation of badly needed, very good and beneficial local banks. Um, and um, partly, I mean, this is one of the, the reasons why we're getting a lot of support for what we're doing in the UK, because a lot of pressure comes from the UK via the city um, by setting up new local banks in the UK um, we can probably create more political awareness of this issue. Uh, the second point, you mentioned the obstacle concerning the international um, uh, markets and how increasingly uh, transactions have moved away from the local economy. Um, again, there's something we can do about that. We can decide to trade locally and uh, the discussion will move on to um, to local currencies, community currencies, and I see a lot of complementarity there. It's, it's a way of making it obvious that you want to trade mainly with your local community and it helps to keep money in the local community. So that will be a, um, one direction to go there. And uh, finally, will you, be, will you be using interest in Hampshire? We will be initially, um, but as I said, I'm quite interested in using this as a, um, as a first step. And then, well, based on that, you can then um, move into local currencies and also non-interest type of banking. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you to the audience. Thank you. Uh, then I will uh, hand over to my...